We condemn violence against any person based on sexual orientation and gender identity, and we promote compassion and support for individuals who struggle with same-sex attraction. This documentary was created out of great love and concern for those who struggle with same-sex attraction. You're about to hear personal stories, testimonies of experts, and summaries of the research on homosexuality. During those experiences, it was quite, you know, I would say, I thought I was happy because it was all that satisfaction, those needs being met right in an instant in a very powerful way. The next day, I would be empty and depressed. I started getting involved with other men sexually on a sexual basis. It involved going online um, and uh, basically hooking up with people, people I didn't know, random sexual acts. I first got involved in my, in my early 20s uh, by, by cruising parks and bars. I felt lost I did, and without direction and without meaning. At around 19 or maybe 20, I had started having my first uh, homosexual uh, experiences. Many homosexuals did not choose to have the homosexual feelings they have felt, sometimes beginning at a very young age. So what causes these feelings of attraction for a person of the same sex? Since this documentary will focus on issues surrounding male homosexuality, let's hear from experts and homosexual men themselves about some of the possible contributing factors. Dr. Joseph Nicolosi, an internationally renowned clinical psychologist and author of numerous books and publications on helping individuals overcome unwanted same-sex attraction, explains. There's no conclusive evidence that it's biologically or genetically predetermined. In fact, there's much more evidence for early childhood uh, factors, especially the relationship with the parents, as determining the sexual orientation. Dr. Dean Bird, psychotherapist and professor and author of over 100 publications on human sexuality, including books and articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals, explains. Let me tell you what the American Psychological Association says. For a long time, they led its members to believe that homosexuality was biologically determined. Uh, in 2008, they changed that position. Uh, they now say that it's some combination of nature and nurture and that it's more complex than they um, have historically led us to believe. To help us better understand same-sex attraction, Floyd Godfrey, a professional counselor and the author of a new book, A Young Man's Journey, Healing for Young Men with Unwanted Homosexual Feelings, will share what he has learned working with over 900 individuals with unwanted same-sex attraction. To begin with, Floyd gives us this simple definition. I think when you, when you look at the research, the easiest way to understand homosexual feelings would, would be by the definition that it's the sexualization of emotional needs and wounds. There are a variety of different contributing factors toward the development of a homosexual orientation. Not everyone may have every single one of those contributing factors. They may have some and not others. When people say that um, people are born gay, I think it's a cop-out. I wasn't born gay. I was sexually abused. I was brought into this. That's my story. One of the most common contributing factors for them would be a wounded sense of, of gender identity or wounded masculinity. And they've struggled with their sense of self-esteem. Growing up through adolescence, I always felt rejected from all the male peers around me. I was always the outcast. Same-sex attraction appears or comes to the surface when I feel inferior, when I don't feel manly enough, when I don't feel masculine enough. Acting out on same-sex attraction is nothing more than chasing this kind of male identity. A lot of what I was thinking about um, was, you know, wow, he has a really nice body, I really like that body, you know? I wish I could have that envy and jealousy going on there, thinking about it far too much. Then, around 11, 12 years old, because he has this alienation and this longing for male connection, that emotional 
desire becomes eroticized. So now we go from attachment problem to gender problem to sexual problem. Now it's becoming a sexual problem. If there's bullying that's gone on, a boy will detach. He doesn't feel safe with other boys. He doesn't feel safe with other men. He detaches when he ought to be attaching, connecting with other boys and men. I think one of the most important things was my overly critical older brother. He was three years older than me and he just criticized everything I did. How I walked, how I talked, everything. So I was so self-conscious that I had very low self-esteem because of that. He has always been an oppressing kind of brother. Uh, he was always bigger than me and he was always stronger than me and, um, and he was always uh, teasing me at home. I remember being teased that I wasn't um, running as fast or kicking as well as the other boys that were my same age. It hurt. And so I started to not play those sports as much. Looking back, I realized all boys do that and that's kind of one of their ways of bonding is bantering a little bit. and. Uh, I see it now in, in the ways that mostly brothers interact. The boys often feel disconnected from their father. Could be because dad was absent, he just wasn't around, he was forced to work. It could be personality differences, dad has different interests than the son. Uh, it could be that uh, father was abusive. Uh, doesn't necessarily matter why, if the, fa if the son is left hungry for the bonding and connection he's not getting, uh, that, that feeling just doesn't, just doesn't disappear. It, it continues. To parents who have children with same-sex attraction, this does not mean that you are the cause of your child's same-sex attraction. Dr. Julie Heron Hamilton, past president of the National Association for Research and Therapy of Homosexuality, a professor and licensed marriage and family therapist, explains the importance of a child's perception of their experiences. Now let me say a word about perceptions. Perceptions are everything. How, um, it's not so much what happens to us that matters as how we perceive what happens to us. So if a boy does not perceive that his father wants that relationship and is safe and welcoming, then he's going to have difficulty connecting with him. Usually the temperament of a child who will go on to have same-sex attractions is that he's sensitive, so he's taking things to heart that happened to him. He might be taking things personally, even if they're not meant personally. I know he loved me deeply, but he was an alcoholic, which made it very difficult to communicate with him. I always felt very weak and very small in his presence. Whenever I had something uh, that I was, uh, let's say, proud of, I always felt that uh, it is still not enough. You should still do something better. Growing up, I felt very disconnected from him. And my mom was also extremely critical of my father. She didn't approve of a lot of things he did, including his drinking. And so she talked him down to me. So I, I lost respect for him and I clung to my mom. So sometimes the boys are confused in relationship with their mother. Uh, mother might be very domineering, might be very controlling or smothering with a boy, leaving him then either overly connected to mom or feeling smothered by mom, not having the opportunity to connect with dad. In some instances we've seen a mother who is domineering over his father and leaving the boy feeling as though men are weak, men are insufficient. My mother was a very strong-willed class A personality that was always, you know, I'm in charge, this is what's going to happen, it's going to be done my way. It made me feel as if the father took a back seat to the mother and the father has no say whatsoever in it. At the same time with my mother, my relation was very close, uh, sometimes even too close, very emotional after their divorce. I had a wonderful relationship with my parents. My parents are wonderful people. Um, I, can't, I can't say no as any, like a lot of people want to say it's a father issue. For me, it wasn't. Many of the boys have also been sexually abused or, or touched inappropriately. And the other extreme to that scale uh, that we see is that some of the boys have never been touched at all, so they're left without healthy connection, uh, without healthy touch, without the hugs and the warmth that they have often needed, and they're actually very hungry for connection, which often makes them vulnerable. The time when I first was abused and I was two years old, I don't remember it at all. I remember because my sister has told me that it happened. So that affect my life? You better believe it did. And some people say, well, it's, you're born that way. Sometimes you're not even remember what happened to you at such an early age. You just don't know. 
when I was about five or six years old, um, someone, uh, a, a male, uh, molested me. My first actual feelings I can remember of same-sex attraction began when I was about 12 years old when I was uh, sexually molested by a next-door neighbor person at that age. I happened to be someone who I looked up to, someone who I admired, that was really what shaped me down this path. Pornography actually for many of the men, I would say more of 75% of them who struggle, have either seen pornography or have been addicted to pornography. Uh, I see pornography as reinforcing some of the imagery that might come along with homosexual feelings. Uh, some of the young men have reported to me that their introduction to pornography actually introduced thoughts and feelings that weren't there before. A very strong addiction developed very soon uh, in my, during my adolescence towards pornography. I ended up getting involved with pornography. Um, it became a medication tool for me to kind of medicate how I was feeling and dealing with it at the time. I viewed pornography quite extensively. Deep down inside, I had always wanted help. I had always wanted to be straight. I would spent the entire day online trying to find someone to hook up with. And when no one met my expectations of what I wanted for someone to hook up with, I just finally laid down in bed and I just started bawling my eyes out. And I said, God, I don't even know if you even exist anymore, but I need help. I don't know what I'm doing. I need some serious help. My motivation for seeking therapy was that the lifestyle has caused me a lot of pain and unhappiness in my life. The attraction was somehow stronger than my, than my will or my determination. I, um, I felt bad. I felt empty. The clients I have that come to my office are all claiming unwanted same-sex attraction and also that they don't, they don't feel like that's who they are. Particularly for me, I needed to have a therapist who could walk me through uh, my whole process, what I would need to do to be able to resolve all of the issues that I had growing up. Through therapy, I began to understand the whys of, of same-sex attraction. And once I understood those, the walls came tumbling down. And I began to understand and appreciate the opposite sex. And those attractions rebounded after being squashed by my same-sex attraction for so many years. And through all this work, which is oftentimes very, very tough, it's not easy. I've definitely made a lot of progress. I've definitely still made mistakes along the way, but my life is now so much better because of it. As soon as I started getting those needs met, the shift started happening. Once the client develops a sense of, of what's caused some of his homosexual feelings, uh, many times they, they'll describe a lack of connection with other men a strong need that's never been satisfied for, for buddies and brothers and father figures. For myself, I wouldn't necessarily, it was a, a sexual addiction, it was a connection addiction is what it was. So we, we take some time to help the client identify those activities he may have been left out from or felt left out so he can actually now in his life get those needs met by engaging some of those activities. So for some men that might look like going to the gym and doing things with the other boys when he had missed that experience. For some men that might look like going camping, or for other men going on hiking trips, or uh, learning how to, to hunt, or to uh, do other mechanical activities that he may have wanted to do and just never felt like he knew how. And the more I did that, the more my self-esteem started to rise. I, I felt accepted. I would say for most men it's an ongoing process of healing but they can often pick out uh, short defining points that are in incredibly encouraging to them. So points in time where they notice that the attractions have diminished or extinguished in their interaction with another man or a boy, where they might have felt attractions sexually very strong, suddenly become more of a friendship feeling. We were all standing there talking, all the guys, and I just looked up at them and just suddenly realized that that attraction was gone and it was completely different now and that I just admired him for the person that he was and all the other feelings went away. I demystified them and thus desexualized them and then I began to notice my sexual attraction to them was lessening and because of this non-sexual bonding with men and my acceptance by them, 
my self-esteem began to rise and I felt more secure in myself and my own masculinity. The big key of my turning point was feeling accepted by him and by those around me. And being in that environment where I was accepted as a guy and as a male, not, not as a homosexual. For me, there really wasn't any kind of define or aha moment. It's just everything slowly kept progressing. Small experiences here and there kept happening for me. A study of identical twins provides conclusive evidence that homosexuality is not solely determined by genetics. In one of the largest studies to date, researchers looked at the identical twins in an Australian database of 33,000 pairs of twins. Since identical twins have identical genes, if homosexuality was caused solely by genetics, then when one identical twin is homosexual, the other twin would be expected to also be homosexual 100% of the time. Instead, what they found was where one identical twin was homosexual, the other identical twin was also homosexual only 11% of the time. Dr. Jeffrey Satinover, a medical doctor with a master's degree in clinical psychology from Harvard and a master's in the science of physics from Yale, explains why he now believes sexual orientation can change and why he has written extensively about reorientation therapy. I had certain, you might say, conventional opinions uh, that are now the standard opinions in the mental health professions about the nature of homosexuality and whether it was changeable or not and so on and so forth. And I had an eye-opening experience getting to know so many people for whom that was not true. I learned about these group of individuals who were undergoing a change in their sexual identity. And then once I studied the science and saw that the whole picture was just not what the conventional public picture is, I really felt very, very high, highly motivated to write about it. Dr. Stanton L. Jones is a clinical psychologist, researcher, and college professor who co-authored, along with Mark Yarhouse, one of the most significant scientific studies showing that some people with unwanted same-sex attraction can and do change. It is widely believed that sexual orientation is utterly unchangeable. For many years, the American Psychological Association has stated that claims of change in sexual orientation were not credible because such claims of change, quote, are poorly documented. The study we have just published fills exactly that gap in the literature. I would argue, based on past research and our own study, that when professional groups issue statements saying that sexual orientation cannot be changed at all, that their conclusions are inconsistent with the evidence. So for the last several months, um, I had a girlfriend, and we were very close. We spoke often of marriage. There were a few things that weren't working out, and she needed to figure some things out. And um, so we ended up breaking up. But it's a good hurt because for the first time in my life, I'm feeling this way about a girl. And I'm feeling this longing to be with her. Because normally, before now, I felt that for guys, and it's, it's awesome. <laughs> when I started to feel these sexual attractions toward women, it just felt great. It was felt. I felt like this is the way it was supposed to be. I don't feel the urge of acting out on my same-sex attraction. Am I interested in having a relationship with women? Yes. Am I definitely, you know, attracted to women in a sexual way? Yes. Dr. Nicholas Cummings is a psychologist who served as the president of the American Psychological Association. He is the co-author of the book, Destructive Trends in Mental Health, The Well-Intentioned Path to Harm. This book describes how the APA has been ignoring the science showing that sexual orientation can change. As chief of mental health for Kaiser Permanente during the gay revolution in San Francisco, uh, my several hundred therapists saw tens of thousands of gay and lesbian patients. We saw not one, not two, not three, but hundreds who changed and achieved very happy heterosexual lives. Now, I believe in civil rights. Uh, I was very active in helping gays be accepted in the APA. 
To this day, I am not opposed to gay marriage. But nonetheless, my position is that the person is the one who decides what they want to do with their orientation. And if somebody decides to be gay, I respect that. If somebody wants to marry a same sex, I respect that. But I also respect the right to disagree. What is clear is that some people can and do change and that um, the research shows that the risk for harm is not any different from any other intervention. The following quote from the medical textbook, Essential Psychopathology and Its Treatment, states, Empirical evidence demonstrates that homosexual orientation can indeed be therapeutically changed in motivated clients and that reorientation therapy does not produce emotional harm. There's a great deal of literature showing that individuals who are motivated can change even without therapy. Some people have spontaneously changed their sexual orientation. In fact, even gay activists will tell you that sexuality is fluid and, and fluctuates within the, the course of a person's lifetime. More people changed a little than changed a lot, but some people changed a lot. Many people didn't change, including ones who wanted to. Of course, there are also a great many people who, uh, who I've seen in my practice over the years who would consider themselves to be gay or lesbian who had no interest in changing. And, and it certainly wasn't my job to convince them that they ought to want to change. To say that you can't change your sexual orientation, <laughs> again, that's just a, a, it comes from so many people who have tried so hard and it didn't ever work. And when someone comes along and says it does, they get so incredibly offended by someone else being successful and they weren't. I can understand that, that makes sense when people are going to be upset about it, but the reality is many people have. Doctors and social scientists who point out the well-documented physical and emotional impacts of the homosexual lifestyle are often labeled as hateful or homophobic, when in reality quite the opposite may be true. A wise man once said, An enemy flattereth, but a friend speaketh the truth. Bringing to light the negative impacts for men who have sex with men can actually be a compassionate position based on a desire to help people avoid a lifestyle that is generally fraught with heartache and disease, and in some cases, even death. The Gay and Lesbian Medical Association recognizes the serious dangers for men who have sex with men in their publication, 10 Things Gay Men Should Discuss with Their Health Provider. They warn that men who have sex with men are at an increased risk for HIV infection Gay men use substances at a higher rate than the general population. Depression and anxiety appear to affect gay men at a higher rate. Men who have sex with men are at an increased risk of sexually transmitted infection with the viruses that cause the serious condition of the liver known as hepatitis. These infections can be potentially fatal. Sexually transmitted diseases occur in sexually active gay men at a high rate. This includes STD infections for which no cure is available. Gay men may be at risk for death by prostate, testicular, or colon cancer. Gay men have higher rates of alcohol dependence and abuse than straight men. Gay men use tobacco at much higher rates than straight men. Problems with body image are more common with gay men than their straight counterparts. Gay men are much more likely to experience eating disorders. This can cause a number of health problems, including diabetes, high blood pressure, and heart disease. Gay men are at risk for human papillomavirus, which puts gay men at an increased risk of anal cancers. And the rate in which this infection can be spread between partners is very high. Depression would be setting in, a tendency towards substance abuse, uh, high levels of anxiety, a report published by the National Association for Research and Therapy of Homosexuality summarizes the research showing that homosexuals have a greater prevalence of suicide, violence, antisocial behavior, substance abuse, promiscuity, paraphilias, being paid for sex, sexual addiction, personality disorders, and psychopathology. In addition, researchers at Harvard University after conducting one of the most exhaustive surveys ever done on the scientific literature related to the health effects of homosexuality, concluded, quote, 
homosexual orientation is associated with a general elevation of risk for anxiety, mood, and substance use disorders, and for suicidal thoughts and plans. And finally, according to the U.S. Center for Disease Control, although men who have sex with men represent only 2% of the U.S. population, they account for 60% of all new HIV infections are 40 times more likely to be infected with HIV and are the only risk group in which new HIV infections have been increasing steadily since the early 1990s. A number of studies show that homosexually identified individuals, gay identified individuals, have a greater uh, inclination to become abusers of alcohol or drug abuse. There are many more uh, what we call pathologies associated with the homosexual condition. Again, pathologies defined as self-defeating, self-destructive, maladaptive behaviors. Some people believe that the reason homosexuals have so many negative mental and physical health outcomes is because society does not accept them. They claim that if society would just accept homosexuality as healthy and normal, then many of these negative outcomes would go away. However, in countries like the Netherlands where homosexuality has been accepted for a long time, there has been no major reduction in negative health outcomes for homosexuals. A panel convened at the United Nations in January of 2013 called Therapy for Homosexuals a violation of human rights, and a law passed in California seeks to ban change therapy for same-sex attracted minors. Bills intended to ban change therapy for homosexuals have been introduced in U.S. state legislatures in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, and a regional office of the World Health Organization issued a false statement claiming that conversion therapies violate human rights protected by international agreements. These are political organizations, and many of their decisions are based not just upon science, but also uh, dependent upon special interest groups, political factors, economic forces, um, public relations. The entire field has become so politicized, and there's really now only one correct point of view that you're allowed to have without paying a high professional or academic price. So where did this widespread orchestrated effort to ban change therapy come from? I think many activists within the gay community feel very threatened and they're often very emotional and upset and very angry when we talk about change and we talk uh, to those who have experienced a shift or a change in orientation uh, because that possibility uh, takes away from them uh, the very identity or the, the label that they've taken on as a gay identified person. Reparative therapy is so threatening to the gay agenda because when an individual stands up and says, I have changed, that's a fundamental threat to one of the basic principles of the gay agenda, which is to have people believe that people are simply born that way. Some people can and do change. Now, um, that doesn't mean that people should be forced to change. It just means that they have a right of that option. They have the right to, to a therapist who says, you can change. I will do the best I can to help you. I don't know if you will change. I don't know if I will be effective. But you have a perfect right to seek it. And you have the right to choose a therapist who's not going to tell you you need to stay that way. You're born that way. There are people that um, I understand are trying to ban uh, reparative therapy, saying you know that this type of therapy may bring depression and other side effects. And I believe that even now, whenever I'm sad or depressed or in not such a happy place, like after this breakup with my girlfriend, even then when I wasn't very happy, still doesn't even compare to how depressed I was all the time before. And without that help, I would still be in that dark place that I was. And now I feel so much joy in my life. I feel part of the, the community of men, and I no longer have these same-sex attractions. And my only concern now is that others will be denied the choice I had to seek this therapy. People come up to my parents or even to my brother and people that I haven't seen in, in a while who had no idea what I'd been through 
and they just said, Caleb looks different. What's different about him? There's something, you know, he's lighter on his feet. He, he looks happier. What's, what's going on? And whenever I hear things like that, to me, it's just a huge, huge statement of just how much I've changed. As human beings, we do have a free will and nobody can uh, infringe this free will of ours. So at the end of the day, it is going to be our own decision uh, what kind of identity we embrace or what kind of lifestyle we decide to lead. But I find it imperative, absolutely imperative, to share the, the very fact that there is an alternative and that there is a way out for those who so wish. For people that have been struggling in their life with same-sex attraction, for those people who want help, banning that therapy, banning that help would be an abuse of human rights.